When I was growing up, my mom was everywhere. If a sports team I was on needed a teen mom, she was there at every game bringing snacks. Costumes needed to be procured or altered for a play. She was there scanning Goodwill and firing up her sewing machine. If kids needed a ride from school or a place to stay for a few hours until their mom could pick them up, she was there with 39 cent Del Taco tacos, feeding anywhere from three to eight children. Every rugby match, every cross country meet, every performance, my mom was there. She worked nights throwing newspapers for the Orange County Register clear through high school in order to be able to be there during the day to do all the things, including working part-time as the on-duty recess lunch playground supervisor throughout most of elementary school. Even after her first and second and third, all the way through her sixth stroke, my mother was always there, and I never had to worry that she would be. It wasn't until I was in college that I understood why she was always there, apart from I love my child and I want to support her. Money was not something in great abundance when we were growing up, and I and my older brother wanted to do all the things. How did two, pay two parents pay for acting and modeling lessons, dance lessons, sports gears, pets, when extra income isn't really a thing? You volunteer. My mom had plenty of free daytime hours to spend doing just that to pay her kids' way. Even now, she says all the time, I don't always have the money to help, but I sure do have the time to. And no doubt that sharing of time rubbed off on me as I found Unitarian Universalism and often saw myself volunteering because I couldn't always afford to participate. I didn't understand for a long, long time that that kind of sacrifice that she went through for us kids, dad worked full time and she did the rest. Cooking, cleaning, chaperoning, field trips, playing chauffeur, getting us to and from school, rehearsals, practices, games, camps, and to this day, she still shows up. Some of you met her when she visited Tapestry, and so she still occasionally comes out to see me preach. She's one of my best friends, even when we try each other's patience. I want to make it abundantly clear that I recognize that not every person in this room or watching the service from home today has that kind of relationship with their mom. And a day like Mother's Day might be difficult if you have a tenuous, painful, or even non-existent relationship with your mom. Your mother may no longer be on this mortal plane and some people may not ever have known their mom. There are also people who want children and who don't have them for whom this day may be a sharp, painful day. I know not every mom thinks they're cut out for being a mother, and not every mom thinks it's the best job they've ever had. And I know plenty who struggle with the loss of self-identity that comes when you become mommy. I want to take a moment to hold that, all of that, in this space. Days like today can be complicated, and the complicated feelings that come with it are real, are valid, and there is space for them here. But it is Mother's Day, and mothering is worth celebrating. And I imagine just about all of us have been mothered at least once. And mothering is no easy feat. It takes a lot of courage to do that work, and it can be largely thankless. Sorry, moms, your kids don't mean it personally. And yet, mothering people show up all the time to keep doing that work. In light of the Supreme Court League, I want to start with the courage it takes to actually decide to become a mother to choose to bring a life into this world. Now we're told all the time that having kids breaks our hearts open in ways that we could never imagine before, and I can only guess what that's like for the person who experiences pregnancy. In conversation with women I know who have given birth, pregnancy is beautiful and awful, <laughs> magical and infuriating. In the months of pregnancy, the body experiences a multitude of changes, weight fluctuations, hair loss, pain, discomfort, nausea, mood swings, weird cravings, plenty of hormonal changes. 
I've seen many women cry with joy to meet their child and in the same breath bemoan never wanting to be pregnant again. And I feel like we don't adequately prepare people for how much the body goes through in the time it takes to create a child. And no two pregnancies, even for the same mother, are ever the same. But women do it anyways. Because when we can choose to be a mother, the end result is worth every effort. And then, of course, there's the actual birth itself, arguably one of the most painful and taxing things a mother will ever experience, messy to say the least, exhausting, and certainly no walk in the park to experience or heal from. Almost 10% of women will experience postpartum PTSD after they give birth. And additionally, current numbers suspect that upwards of 30 or more percent women experience postpartum depression. Actually bringing a child into this world takes major guts, and it is not for the faint of heart. Follow that with the struggles of the decisions surrounding baby, do we bottle feed or breastfeed, cry it out or soothe, disposable diapers or washable ones. Many of these decisions are ones that mothers are judged for, and there's a pattern of continued bravery in the face of that judgment. Despite all other opinions and probably minimal sleep, moms are usually always putting baby's best interests at heart. Then there's the actual child raising, helping children grow and learn and slowly but surely become good, kind, compassionate people. Pew Research states that roughly 68% of American mothers do have a partner at home, while another 28% are single mothers. And mothers are more likely to work at least 25 hours a week in addition to their mothering. It's a lot of time spent working to take care of kids and a lot of time spent working to take care of kids. For many children, mom is parent, teacher, friend, therapist, and warden. She plays all the things all the time because that's just what moms do. Even when they're exhausted or frustrated or even just want one moment of peace, moms almost always find a way to show up. I'm not suggesting that moms are always doing the hard work alone. There are partners and grandparents and many others who contribute to raising a child. But by and large, the typical mother does the lion's share of tasks of child rearing, family raising, and homemaking. If that was not the case, we would not have conversations about the unpaid labor of mothers. So in case no one told you today, thanks mom. You do so much for our family. I also recognize that mothering shows up in lots of different ways other than biological mother. And that also takes a certain courage to do. Adoptive moms who want and wait and hope for a child and know that one day there will be tough questions down the road of who am I? Where do I come from? Why didn't they want me? All while striving to make the child, their child, feel loved and valued in the home that they do have. We have foster mothers who could get a call at all hours of the day asking to take in and care for an emergency placement on a child's most exceptionally difficult day, spending that time tending to wounds that sometimes have no words and protecting a child they may only know for a brief few hours. Stepmoms who know they aren't their mom but recognize that their role in a child's life can leave lasting imprints and so work to be a good example and teach where they can. Grandmothers who are watching their daughters become mothers and hover in the space between, mom, I need your help and I can raise my own child and letting them learn as they go, as they always have. Aunties who take them under their wing, tell them all the silly stories from when we were kids, loving, teaching, encouraging, and then giving them back when they're done. Until next time. We have scores of teachers in the classroom who spend more waking hours with their students than they see their own children. 
teaching their school subject, yes, but doing that while tending hurt feelings, silly outbursts, tempers, and tears. Almost 60, excuse me, almost 76% of teachers in the United States identify as women. That's a lot of stand-in moms in a lot of classrooms, and they take their jobs seriously and with pride. Satya and I both know that to some degree, we also have a hand in mothering the children of this congregation. An extension of my ministry and Satya's is knowing that we too have something to teach the children that come here every Sunday. I hope in us that they see compassion and respect, strong but gentle leadership, kindness and love. I hope they say, see the same things that our mothers in our congregation teach their children at home, exemplified here, a reinforcement of the importance of the things that you all show in your daily lives. I hope, when they see, I hope what they see from us in conversations, in religious education, buoys the efforts of your parenting that has set afloat. I know that there are a lot of generalizations in today's sermon. As I mentioned, I know not everyone has, has experienced mothers, motherhood, or mothering the same. It may sound like my expectation of mothers is that they have to do all the work. My expectation, though, is much different. My expectation is that we get to choose how we show up in the world, and in the version of mothers I have mentioned here today, they are the best of what we can be. And best doesn't mean perfect. Best means showing up, doing the hard work. It's doing the best that we can for those of us that need the guidance that we can provide, even and especially when it's the last thing that we want to do. Mothers can be two moms, or none, or a whole bunch of mother-like figures. After all, as the saying goes, it takes a village. There is no one way here today in my limited experience on this earth, and certainly as a person who has occasionally mothered a little, there's no way that I can make sure that I touch on every single version of mothers. Relationships aren't perfect, they aren't cookie cutter, and there is no one right way to be a mother or a mother figure or to mother others. Familial dynamics, gender identities, and just plain being human can be complex. But here, right now, we celebrate those who have done that for us. We give thanks to those that mothered us in our infancy, in our youth, our adolescence. We show gratitude for the guidance that we received as young adults, cherished the changed dynamics as we grow our own lives and perhaps grow our own families. We mourn the mothers that cannot be here, who have moved from this world, joining the ancestors. We acknowledge the pains of mothers not being what we needed or what we wanted or the guilt of not being the mother that we think we should be. We thank our Mother Earth for sustaining us so that we may help grow ourselves, our children, and others. Small shout out to my fellow pet moms. I know it's not the same as raising a child. But we too show care and nurturing for someone, something that needs our help. And I'm willing to bet that you do the same thing for the children in your life, too. Showing up as a mom is hard, full of second guesses, confusion, frustration, brimming with love, pride, and joy. Being a mom, taking the role of mothering for another is the height of courage. And today, of all days, we recognize the ups and downs the sacrifices and the celebrations that accompany it. So thank you, moms of all kinds, for all that you do. We love you. Amen. <laughs>